Okay, so we're back to the grinding and back to our weekly um, lectures. So we're going to start the 20th century with inventions. And the 20th century is going to see a lot of change of, in technology in the United States. Keep in mind, we already had um, the steam engine, so we have railroads and steamboats. We have a telegraph line, um, and so Americans are just going to advance those already designed products. Um, so you guys are going to need the name of the invention, the who did it, when they did it, their significance, and then in the significance you're going to add one thing from each video that I show you. So here are a sample pictures of our inventions. We have a telephone here, a Model T4, an airplane created by my ancestors, a camera, we're going to look at the phonograph, the typewriter, the electric light bulb, and a vacuum cleaner. So our first invention is a telephone, that's this right here, created by Alexander Graham Bell um, in 1876. And the significance was to communicate via voice across long distances. So make sure you're writing in your own words. You do not have to copy my slide word for word. But Alexander Graham Bell created the telephone in 1876 to communicate long distances with voice. So this is going to replace the telegraph. Instead of sending messages and getting it on the other end, um, you have voice. You can communicate with your voice. The video I'm going to show you is from a TV show called Green Acres. Um, Green Acres, they're on a farm. They have one town in the whole, or one phone in the whole town. Um, and so here you have like an original older phone, and then they're going to be communicating with someone in another city. So it's just a fun little video, but tell me one thing you notice about the telephone. I wonder if I could speak to Mr. Oliver Douglas. What about? This is personal. Calling from New York. How's the weather back there? Right. It's fine. Hey, the weather's fine in New York. New York? Who are you talking to? Hello, this is Sam Drucker. My name's Felton. Put that down. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Felton. I want to speak to Mr. Oliver Douglas. Is that Carl really from New York? Yes. Uh, let me say something. Go away. Oh, please, Sam, I never talked to nobody in New York. <laughs> then Mr. Felton Floyd's never talked to anybody in New York. Is it all right if he says hello? No. All right. <laughs> hello, New York. This is Floyd Smoot. <laughs> uh, no, this is Sam Drucker. Who did you want to talk to, Mr. Felton? Felton? Don't, don't. I haven't heard from him in years. <laughs> How are you, Gomer? This is Judson Felton. Are you any can of Gomer? No. Well, where do you live? In New York. Oh, well, he lives in Kansas City. You got the wrong number. Uh, Miss Bromley, will you get me that number back again? Dr. Mr. Felton. What line's he in? Well, he's an attorney. I used to be associated with him. You ever win many cases? Yes, we... Um, Mrs. Bromley. Who's she? <laughs> Mr. Felton's secretary. You mean Judson Carter Felton? Fire Judson Carter Felton? <laughs> Hello. Hello, Oliver. How are you? Oh, I'm just fine. Good, I'm glad. Hello. 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 Who's this? Dora Siffel. Who's this? <laughs> My name's Felton. Gomer? <laughs> no, not Gomer. Look, I'm talking from New York. New York? How's the weather there? It's fine. Look, I want to talk to Mr. Oliver Douglas. Try Sam's store. Uh, this, uh, I'm, uh, I'm in Sam's store now. Hello? Who's this? Oliver Douglas. <laughs> oh, Mr. Douglas, there's a call for you at Sam's store. You better get over there. That's where I am now. Hello, Oliver. No, this is Dara Siffel. <laughs> Adam, will you please hang up? All right. <laughs> Hello? 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 I, oh, the miserable, I was cut off. So that's just to show you kind of um, the modernization and the technology that took over and how people adapted to it or didn't adapt to it. Um, this show is set way outside of the time period we're studying, but I just thought it was funny. Okay. Um, so the next inventor that we're going to look at is Thomas Edison. Thomas Edison invented the light bulb um, in 1879. 
and it allowed companies to extend work hours because they could now light their factories and their places of business. So if you have lights, people can continue working, whereas before the workday would end when the light when the sun went down because you can't work anymore. Um, and individuals could have more time awake because they could have lights in their homes which would allow them to stay awake and complete whatever tasks they need to complete. So the invention of the light bulb lengthens the day. Um, um, so this was created by Thomas Edison in 1879, and it basically extended the day, both the work day and then the home personal day. So I'm going to show you a quick video on Thomas Edison. I just want you to take one note about him. Thomas Edison was born in Millen, Ohio on February 11, 1847. He didn't learn to talk until he was almost four years old. In school, he often daydreamed and was labeled as mentally slow by his teacher. Because of these comments, young Edison's mother took him out of school and homeschooled him. In 1854, his family moved to Port Huron, Michigan. Edison sold candy and newspapers on trains. He became a telegraph operator after saving the daughter of a station agent from an oncoming train. He moved to Louisville, Kentucky in 1866 and became an employee of Western Union. Starting in 1872, Edison worked on the quadruplex telegraph system. It allowed telegraphs to send and receive four signals at the same time on the same wire. Edison's system wasn't a new invention, but an improvement on the duplex system created by Moses G. Farmer and Joseph Stearns. Edison's first invention was a phonograph in 1877. Many people today incorrectly associate the phonograph with the record player. Edison's device recorded sound on the cylinders and was geared as a recorder for the voice, not for recording and playing back music. It was the gramophone that recorded the discs and became the record player that we know today. Edison did not invent the first electric light bulb. He invented the first commercially practical incandescent light. Edison bought the patent on what was probably the first invented light bulb. Later, he came across Joseph Wilson Swan, who had developed and patented a working light bulb. Edison made Swan a partner and eventually bought him and his patent out, giving him full ownership of the patent. Edison patented a system for electrical distribution in 1880 in order to capitalize on his electric lamps. Edison used direct current to power his system, which had its limitations. And when these limitations were made public, Edison launched a propaganda campaign to convince people of the superiority of direct current. This war of the currents, as it was called, brought in the involvement of Nikola Tesla, an inventor and rival of Edison who had created the alternating current power generator. Alternating current eventually proved to be a better system of transmitting power. In 1888, Edison started working on inventing a motion picture camera. Edison passed on the work of creating the camera to one of his assistants. Edison himself had very little involvement in the invention. On May 20th, 1891, the kinetoscope and the kinetograph were revealed. Moving images were taken with the kinetograph and shown through a peephole on the kinetoscope. Some of the things that Edison filmed with this early motion picture camera included a man doing tricks on his single gear bike and two cats boxing with each other. One of the lesser known ideas of Edison was concrete furniture. It came from a failed attempt at making concrete houses. Edison used what was supposedly a lightweight foam concrete to manufacture various home furnishings. Edison shipped out some of his furnishings to put them on display, but they arrived broken up. This caused Edison to close down his line of concrete creations for good. Many today consider Edison to have been an atheist, but this is not true. Edison had spiritual and religious beliefs that were a mix between pantheism and deism. Thomas Edison never really invented major breakthroughs. He took credit for the inventions of others, and most of his patents were modifications on already existing ideas. Edison was, however, a very good businessman, and used his business skills to improve on current ideas instead of inventing new ones. Edison died of complications of diabetes on October 18, 1931. While there are lesser known inventors who have done greater things than Edison and are more deserving of the praises and rewards given to him, there is no doubt that he certainly had an impact on the world. So ends the history of Thomas Edison. Alright, next is Henry Ford. He created the automobile. Um, he also created the assembly line to create his automobile. Um, the first automobile is called a Model T Ford. It was created in 1908, and with it, there's two significances. One was that it, it invented the assembly line, which changed how things are made. So instead of um, one person building from start to finish, different people had different jobs. So someone put the engine in, someone put the wheels on, someone painted it. Um, all the jobs were divided up into smaller jobs. Um, which would employ more people, and it would make the process of building something easier. Um, so people could make a car quicker than if just one person worked on it. Um, and it also increased the speed of travel. In the 
because even in the very early 1900s, when Ford went off of uh, determined to manufacture automobiles, it was a very risky thing. No one really quite knew if this could be done. Well, there was a certain need for transportation innovation. Ford, like a lot of mechanics, engineering types, became very fascinated with the internal combustion engine. He tries to build this thing in, in his garage behind his house. It was very, very crude. It had one cylinder. It generated two or three horsepower. This was the first prototype of the horse's carriage that Henry Ford built. His early companies, the ones that failed, his investors wanted to build a car for rich people. Ford, from the beginning, wanted to build a sturdy, inexpensive car for the mass of Americans. I have set out to build the best motor car for popular use. The first car affordable for the common man. Henry Ford was about the democratization of transportation. Uh, you no longer had to be a Commodore to be able to go from one place to another. Ford stood in marked contrast, I think, to a lot of the big business manufacturing figures of the period. He believed that working people should be treated in a humane way. They should be paid a decent wage. They should have a healthy environment in which to work. It was Ford who instituted the $5 a day, who doubled the wage of his workers, that his workers were going to become his customers. The Model T takes the American market by storm from the very beginning. It's a tremendous success. What Ford did was create a vehicle we could all afford. Henry Ford created what became the dominant, the most important industry uh, in the American economy. Henry Ford was the most important business and entrepreneurial figure in the modern world period. Next is George Eastman. George Eastman um, developed a small box camera. That's this right here. So they had cameras before, but they were huge and, like, really bulky. Um, and this happened in 1888. The significance was so that an average person can take a photograph and, and have pictures taken more frequently. Um, and he helped to develop mov the movie industry with roll film. Um, so before, photographers were the only ones who really had cameras and who could use them. Um, and so now, it's making it easier for everybody to use the camera. We have progressed way past that, and now you all have cameras on your phones, so you can take pictures whenever you want. That wasn't the case back in the day. You used to have to carry around this thing and then take it and get it developed and all, the, all kinds of stuff. It wasn't as simple as opening the Photos app on your iPhone. You've got Facebook albums full of photos. You have photos on your computer desktop, on your mobile phone, on your bedroom wall. You see photos in magazines and newspapers on the size of buses and, of course, in your family albums. We take photos for granted in a major way. But creating a picture that looked exactly like the person or thing that you were photographing wasn't always obvious. In fact, in the past, it was a big mystery. How could you, in essence, take your reflection in the mirror and freeze it in there? In the 9th century, the Arab scientist Al-Hazen had come up with the idea of using the camera obscura, which was literally a dark room or box with a single small hole in one side that let light through. This would project the image outside into the wall inside. During the Renaissance, artists like Leonardo da Vinci used this method to introduce 3D scenes onto a flat plane so that they could copy things like perspective more easily. In 1724, Johann Heinrich Schultz discovered that exposing certain silver compounds to light altered their appearance and left marks wherever the light touched. 
Essentially, Schultz found a way to record the images that Al Hazen was able to project, but only for a little while. Schultz's images disappeared soon after he had made them. It wasn't until 1839 that people figured out how to project images into light-sensitive surfaces that would retain the image after exposure, and thus photography was born. At that point, it was mostly two inventors who fought for the best way to make photos. One was British scientist Henry Fox Talbot, whose calotype process used paper and allowed many copies to be made from a single negative. The other inventor, Louis Daguerre, was an artist and chemist in France. He developed something called a daguerreotype, which used a silvered plate and which produced a sharper image. But the daguerreotype could only make positive images, so copies had to be made by taking another photo. In the end, the daguerreotype won out as the first commercially successful photographic process, mostly because the government made it freely available to the public. So now that photography was available, getting a picture of yourself would be a snap, right? Well, not exactly. This process still required a whole dark room at the location of the photograph, which was a big hassle. Picture the early photographers lugging enormous trailers with all their equipment wherever they wanted to take a picture. Not only that, but the early processes had extremely long exposure times. To get a good photo, you would have to stand perfectly still for up to two minutes. This led to the development of inventions like the head holder, a wire frame that would hide behind you while supporting your head. It's also why you don't see people smiling in early photographs. It's not that life was that bad; it was just hard to keep a steady grin for more than a few seconds. So people opted for a straight face look. And then George Eastman came along. Eastman believed that everyone should have access to photography, and he spent many late nights mixing chemicals in his mother's kitchen to try to achieve a dry plate photographic process. This would allow exposed negatives to be stored and developed later at a more convenient place, instead of carting those dark rooms necessary for wet plates around. After starting a business which initially made dry plates, Eastman eventually discovered plastic roll film. That would fit in handheld, inexpensive cameras. These cameras sold by the millions under the tagline "You push the button, we do the rest." While Eastman was largely responsible for making photography a universal pastime, even he could not have dreamed of the ways photography had since shaped the world. It's now estimated that over 380 billion photographs are taken each year. That's more photographs each day. Then were taken in the first hundred years after photography was invented. Say cheese. All right. The next inventor we're going to look at is the typewriter created by Christopher Scholes. And the typewriter, um, as you know, is used to type things. He invented the QWERTY keyboard. So if you open your phone and you look at your keyboard. Um, at the top, underneath the numbers, it says K W E R T Y. That very first row, QWERTY. That's a QWERTY keyboard. So this is the same keyboard that you guys still use today on your phones and on all the computers we use. Remember to take one video note for the significance. In 1913, it was discovered that a computer could drive a typewriter, and word processing was born. The word processor is still with us today in the form of programs based on the typewriter, with tab settings, rulers, and sliders defining the margins. These programs are the source of all printed ink on paper that we read today. In 1962, it was discovered that a computer could drive a typesetting machine, and typesetting programs were born. The conceptual model of these programs is the typeset galley. That is the column of text exposed onto paper in a specific font, size, and column width. In 1984, it was discovered that a computer could drive a xerographic copier, and the laser printer was born. The laser printer started out imitating the way text came off a typewriter, but with the combination of the Apple Macintosh and Adobe PostScript, everything changed. The laser printer behaved like a typesetter, where we saw various fonts, sizes, and weights of type. The common theme in these events is that text on screen is intended to represent what text will look like when printed. 
However, today, the surface of the screen is no longer a substitute for information on the printed page. The surface of the screen is the page. All right. Our next invention is the vacuum cleaner. Um, I don't know how many of you actually vacuum or help your moms vacuum, but I want to challenge you. This week, help your mom vacuum or dad vacuum or whoever's responsible. I want you guys to vacuum at least your rooms, but offer to vacuum a little bit more um, because this was an invention that we're learning about. You can apply your learning. The vacuum was created by John Thurman in 1899. Now, um, something that deeply bothers me, but we'll get past it. Back in the day, women were responsible for cleaning the house, and the men went to work, and women cleaned the houses, which is fine. So, uh, the vacuum cleaner, the impact was that it provided more, more leisure time for women because it didn't take as long to clean the carpets anymore. The vacuum cleaner sped up that process. So, yay vacuum cleaner for making more time for women. Yay 2019 for making time for you students to vacuum the house for your parents this week. So, I want everybody to vacuum the house for their parents this week at least once. Maybe try it again next week. But I want you to try and vacuum this week. All right, Thomas Edison and the phonograph um, was created in 1877. The significance was so that people could listen to pre-recorded music. All right, last invention, the airplane. It was invented by Orville and Wilbur Wright, and they're actually my ancestors on my dad's side. Um, if I trace them back through my great-grandparents, um, they're like my great-uncles four times removed. That all gets complicated, but anyhow... Um, they created the first airplane, and the significance is that it changes military and travel for people around the world, and this happened in 1902. Some of you have been in planes, some of you have not, but you know that we have planes now, and that's how we travel, but they've changed significantly from these first couple images of the airplane here. The Wright Brothers, the first successful airplane, 1903. Wilbur Wright was born on April 16, 1867, in Millville, Indiana, and Orville Wright was born on August 19, 1871, in Dayton, Ohio. Both brothers were pioneers credited with inventing the first airplane. In late 1901, the Wright brothers had gathered the aerodynamic data they needed to build a successful flying machine, and in 1902, the Wright brothers had built their latest glider based on this data. They had identified a wing shape that was efficient, producing the expected lift, and engineered controls that were responsive. The glider would also use a trailing rudder for yaw, therefore enabling the Wright brothers to navigate in the air in all three dimensions. Following this success, the next stage for the brothers was powered flight. No manufacturers could provide an engine light enough and powerful enough for their needs, so the brothers had to design and build their own. The flyer was designed in a biplane configuration with a wooden airframe and a wingspan of 12.3 meters or 40 feet 4 inches. The pilot flew on his stomach on the lower wing, steering by moving a cradle attached to his hips. This cradle pulled wires which warped the wings and turned the rudder. The Wright Flyer 1, based on the previous glider, was set up near Kitty Hawk, North Carolina, in the United States of America on December 17, 1903, where there was a hill and a good breeze. The first flight lasted 12 seconds, traveling 36 meters or 120 feet with Orville piloting. Three more flights were made on that day, with Wilbur achieving the best flight, covering 255.6 meters or 852 feet in 59 seconds. The Wright brothers had made history with the first successful flight of a controllable, self-propelled, heavier-than-air machine. Over the next few years, the Wright brothers developed new flyers while remaining secretive in an attempt to secure patents and contracts. Subscribe for more history videos. Thank you for all your support on the Simple History YouTube channel. If you enjoy the channel, please consider supporting us at Patreon. All right. 
So that is the last invention for your inventions lecture. I'm sorry this one was long, but I do like showing you guys a little bit of the videos. I will be checking your inventions notes on Friday, and these people and their inventions will show up your quiz on Friday. Have a great week. See you in class.